I'd like us to begin by imagining a plate of food. And for the Samoans here, I know how easy this is. Imagine a plate of food. And then I'd like to talk about a way of looking at that food that be goes beyond the plate, beyond the recipe. And it's a way of looking at food that's about reclaiming tradition and health, about empowering chefs, and stimulating economy. I call this the power of cuisine. Oh. I was born here in New Zealand. And I had the incredible good luck to grow up on the Pacific Islands. Um, I moved to Fiji in the 70s from the shopping in the dreary, sanitized supermarkets of New Zealand to the marketplace in Suva, Fiji, which was just an unbelievable and welcome shock. Um, when we arrived there, there was a dock strike. My father calls this an intervention. And none of the palangi ingredients were available. There was no butter, no sugar, no potatoes, no bread. I, you can feel my pain when I say this. <laughs> and my mom was thrown into the market to cook the family meals and me alongside with her. Uh, looking back, it must have been awful for her because she had three whiny kids, a whole new food culture to negotiate. But I absolutely loved it. And I, I, looking back, I think that's when I kind of decided to become a chef. I ended up living in New York and I began to put restaurants together for a large US restaurant group. So I was based out of New York, but traveling to Miami and Las Vegas. At the same time, living in New York, I began developing community food programs. I'd never seen homeless people before. It was, a, it was just a foreign concept to me. And I set up one program in particular with a group of friends delivering meals from five-star New York City restaurants to the homeless community in New York City subway system. I began to question the dividing of the food world into those who had food and those who did not. Because this is not how it was in the South Pacific. Everyone had food. So even though the restaurants paid, paid my bills and were very amazing creatively, it was the food programs that fed my heart. I got offered a consultancy in the Caribbean putting 21 restaurants into three resorts. What really surprised me was I saw that all the food was being imported. But I'd, I'd been to the markets, I'd seen the product, I'd, I'd met quite a few of the farmers. So I, I set about making growing contracts, connecting the farmers to the hotels. You see, I had control of the menu, so I could write their product right onto the menu. I really realized the power of being a chef because through my menus, I could leave literally millions of dollars in small islands. The menus were the business plan of the nation. One thing did keep coming up. The cooks did not think their own local cuisine was good enough for the, for the restaurants. Good enough for home, but not for the restaurants. And I knew that local cuisine requires local agriculture. So to get a wholesale swing into supply locally, I had to encourage the development of local cuisine. You see, when food, local food is in tourism, local cuisine is in tourism, it becomes tourism for everybody, from the farmers to the fishermen to the coconut oil makers to the kokosam oil makers, the jam and jelly makers, everyone. I often think of Thailand and I think of all the street food. All those vendors are family economies. I see this as a very successful cuisine because the food is Thai in origin, it reaches into the production communities and creates a whole dynamic of prosperity. But there's more. When you buy something from a vendor there, something magical happens. That little glance to see if you enjoy a dish when it's passed over. Food creates a culture of kindness. So I knew in the Pacific it was the same as the Caribbean. Our, our menus in tourism were very heavy with Western content. I think many, any of you who have been to, the, been to the Pacific have often complained about that. Where's the Fijian food? Where's the Samoan food? But you know, part of it was our own fault. I grew up in the Pacific, and we always think that everything from overseas is better, including food. In our minds, Pacific Island food was not as good as, say, French or Thai or Italian. Colonialism also had been very thorough, right down to their palate and their perception. And then food colonization, with the avalanche of fatty meats and then all the processed foods, these seem to have displaced the understanding of Pacific food, but also literally what people ate, with a ter terrible impact on Pacific health. So when tourists came to the Pacific, they generally asked if what they 
of more of what they had at home. But remember the the original Pacific diet was full of like coconuts, greens, seaweeds, fish, superfoods. The messaging from tourists was something that began to bother me even as a young, even as a child. I could, I could sense the um, asking for not not as, asking for overseas food had an insult embedded into it. If you consider for a moment, if a whole lot of people go to a small island and they say we don't want your food, food is what our mothers make us. It's what our cultural sense of self is. It's, it is us. So it's kind of an insult. I think it's actually very spiritually destructive. Around this time, I met Tracy Burno, a tourism academic. She's at AUT here now. And we decided that if we put a beautiful Pacific cookbook together, it would give the chefs a tool, but also create some awareness in the tourism market. So I came back to the South Pacific. There was an organic, what we found was amazing. There was an organic revolution happening through the region. Now organics is the luxury brand of cuisine, but in the Pacific, the methodology of organics is the same as the Polynesian and Melanesian farming methods, so it, so it validates tradition. It was also in the way the Pacific people came together over food. In the Pacific, the food strengthens and creates communities. The story of the food is the story of the people. There was amazing leadership in food. I'll give you an example. In Samoa, there's an NGO called Women in Business Development. And they've steered Samoa's organic revolution so that there are now close to a thousand organic family farms in little Samoa. Just let that sink in. That's just a staggering number. A friend of mine who's a leading GMO activist said to me, but apparently, a group of determined Samoan ladies have managed to do something that world governments can't do. <laughs> then there was my dear friend and mentor, Suliana Siwati in Baum, Fiji, and she's saving Pacific heritage crops. She is a, an expert in traditional healing through food. So she understands that when you lose a crop, you don't just lose the food, you lose knowledge, you lose culture. There were many more women like this, Sashi Karan, Fiji, Vatasi Mackenzie in Vanuatu, Papilo Foliaki in Tonga, many, many more. And I realized as I went that these women were not just making smart food systems, they were creating a whole way to live. So this began to emerge as my mission. And I'm using Samoa as an example here. If you take Samoa and food culture, run the organics through it, and put it into the industry, into the tourism industry, you create all these benefits. Samoa, unique Samoa destination brand. A lot of money stays in the country because less food is imported. The trade, of the Samoa trade brand, think of French cuisine and thus French trade around the, around the validation through the cuisine. The chefs get to cook their own food, finally, the food that they're good at, Samoan food. So I began to see food and cuisine as a development tool, and I wrote all this thinking into the cookbook as I went. So six countries, about 165,000 coconuts um, later, I'd, I'd finished. The GFC, meantime, had hammered the US. I lost my home. I actually lost everything. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty confronting. Um, and I could have returned to save my kind of US life, but I'd started making decisions based on what would I be happiest with on the day that I died. And it, it always came back to this book. It seemed like such a small thing to give to a community that had given me so very much. However, in the week that Merkai launched, I was down to 40 bucks in my bank account. I had to actually had to go home to my parents. But then something amazing happened. I caught, now, I, now I view it as a miracle. Merkai was shortlisted for the biggest cookbook award in the world, the Gourmand Award in Paris. It's the equivalent to a Pulitzer. Our competition was the New York Times. I think this group would have heard of the New York Times, right? <laughs> okay, good. And then the other book we were competing with was the cookbook from Noma, Noma Restaurant. And the day before, Michelin had named Noma the top restaurant in the world. 
I actually felt really stupid being there because these guys were so important and so big. And we were, we were there with this little book from the South Pacific. It seemed unbelievable. And, and yeah, I did feel pretty <laughs> embarrassed to be there most of the time I was there. But we did win the award. And at one spectacular moment, it felt like Pacific Island cuisine was taking its rightful place at the table next to the great cuisines of the world. Now, the Power of Cuisine um, model was so successful as a cookbook, we made a TV series called Real Pacific. And in the series, we traveled, I cleaned up with Zoom Side Productions here in Auckland, we traveled around the Pacific kind of creating a group of cuisine ambassadors as we went. I'm going to show you a clip from Real Pacific that's taken from a few countries that explains the approach of the television series. Our journey began with the same unfortunate story told by chefs across the South Pacific. I'm always stuck in the kitchen cooking Western food and European food and I feel that the traditional cooking with me is slowly fading away. You know, unfortunately, a lot of our people, they're, they're being sort of brainwashed that it's no longer good anymore to eat their own food. It's sad. You would never think of going to Thailand and not having Thai food. Mm. I think Fiji's the same. In Fijian homes, there's all this amazing food that isn't necessarily in the hotels. We're so stuck in that Western way of, of presenting food. On cuisine des choses locaux. Et y a pas un, un commentaire. The traditional dishes that we grew up with, it started to drift away. If we lost them, um, I think we're hopeless. We wanted to tell a different story, the story of South Pacific cuisine. You look at this food, there's wisdom and the history and there's survival and there's agriculture. It goes way beyond the recipe so healthy. Yeah. Polynesian food has such a bad rap for being unhealthy. I think it's completely yeah. unjustified. We selected up-and-coming chefs accustomed to creating Western-style food in tourist resorts and took them on a journey back into their own food cultures. In the Pacific, people come together over food, so food underpins relationships. Bon appétit. Food in the Pacific builds and strengthens community. The story of the food is the story of the people. We took resort chefs to meet the guardians of South Pacific cuisine knowledge and wisdom. We have black dalo, green dalo, pink dalo, purple dalo. When you have just one kind of taro, you lose all this knowledge. This is pico pico or fiddlehead fern. We connected the chefs with the primary food producers in their countries. You can never find this in a restaurant. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh wow. My goodness, look at that. Yeah. Pico Pico. And the chefs created five star meals using entirely locally sourced ingredients and recipes. The only thing that isn't local on this is what? <laughs> the plate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the plate. The chefs experienced their cuisine taking its place among the world's great food traditions. I'd come here tomorrow if that was definitely on the menus. We have something very special, but we never have this thinking of using it. Reconnecting chefs with their roots and providing an opportunity to present their traditional cuisine in a five-star context facilitated humbling transformations. Pacific Island food has just as much of a place within the culinary market as Italian or, or Greek food. Kind of affirmed my place as a Polynesian chef, knowing my food really, it's like knowing myself. It's opened my eyes to the fact that we are all connected through food and heritage. Everything is about traditional Tongan food now and I'm proud of it. Seeing that sort of food on like menus and restaurants over here and just seeing like that sort of food being appreciated like in that way was like it was a great feeling. Today I was proud to be a Cook Islander. 
and for the local food producers, it was just as profound. <laughs> this is the local market for our farmers, a local market that we've been trying to reach and we haven't really gotten there. And I think this is the beginning of something absolutely wonderful. Everyone experiences a simple but powerful fact that local cuisine can be a successful part of daily menus. I just needed someone from outside to come in like Robert to say, yes, Fatasi, what you've been saying we can do. And this is it, it happened today. We took our cuisine to the next level. In tourism-led economies, menus are the business plan of a nation. Where the cuisine goes, the agriculture will follow. And if a country can recognise this, everybody wins. Robert is our missing link. And, and um, I'm going to get so emotional. <laughs> I had so much fun doing this and I, I really want to continue doing it. We're demonstrating that the way to connect tourism and agriculture is through cuisine. And the people who control this cuisine are the chefs. It's the chefs who decide what dishes and what produce will be used on the menus of restaurants and resorts. They choose whether the ingredients for the recipes are imported from overseas or come from local primary producers. We wanted to tell a different story the story of South Pacific cuisine, an aspirational vehicle that ignites chefs to become powerful agents of change, who can change the livelihoods of farmers, fishermen and artisanal food producers. Books and TV glamorise and package cuisine. They educate by entertaining. I love my roles on both My Kitchen Rules and My Archive Masters, partly because I get to work with these very sexy people, as you can see. But also, these shows have gotten people cooking again, and that's taking charge of your life. Marikai Masters, in particular, I want to I want to single out. I think it's the world's only indigenous reality cooking show. It's raising the hidden treasure of Aotearoa's original cuisine. There was an interesting difference between the two. In My Kitchen Rules, when a team was eliminated, they cried and everyone else looked relieved because they weren't going home. In Marikai Masters, when a team was el eliminated, everyone else cried. They didn't want them to leave. You see, kai is not just food. In the indigenous world, kai is a matrix of connections to, the, to culture, community, the natural and supernatural world. If you raise the kai, you raise all that. Yeah, our second book about Samoa also won a Gourmand Award, this time for the best TV chef cookbook in the world. And this book was made at the request of the um, Samoan Prime Minister, who's a, who's a big um, proponent, proponent and energizer of organics in the region. I've got a lot of respect for that, that his role in that. And so both these books kind of really went to the top of the world, but I think the big take from it, for me, from that award and from this book, was that it provided the impetus for women in business development, the Organic Farming Collective in Samoa, and I to work together to create a supply system. So we now have 44 of Samoa's organic farms supplying seven of their hotels. That project is ongoing. So my work thus far, I've been really about the economics of food, but what's emerged for me most is the issue of Pacific health. The South Pacific is in a crisis. Two Fijians a day have a leg amputated. American Samoa, Nauru and the Cooks, the world's most obese nations, with Tonga and Samoa coming right behind them. We've all heard these numbers, and they're actually really daunting. Hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, heartbreak, broken families, shattered dreams. And yet the answer to good health is sitting right there in the South Pacific, in Pacific farms and Pacific villages, Pacific markets, and in the rustic dishes Pacific grandmothers cook. We all have the power to change this. If you go into any farm or village or market in the Pacific, you'll see the toolkit for good health. Local cuisine can put Pacific people on the right side of the future.
A lot of the health initiatives are based in threat and fear. Images of rotting feet, diabetic feet, don't have sugar, don't have salt. I saw one that said, that, said don't have coconut, coconut milk. I thought, like, fat chance of that happening around here. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I don't know about you guys, but if I'm told not to have something, I right away want it. So I just don't think it's going to work. And I also know that going back to the knowledge and the foundation of the original cuisine system, you take care of all of that. I teamed up with the amazing Cindy of Samoa, the amazing and fabulous and single fabulous Cindy of Samoa recently at the Wellington and Christchurch Food Show. And, so, and we're going to be at Auckland at the, in the last week of July, by the way. And with Cindy, I discovered, we discovered together the magic of combining humour with culture and wellness. Actually, there's not much two divas with a cup of coconuts and some lipstick can't do. So <laughs> watch this space for more for me and Cindy because we've got, we've got big plans. We're und undaunted, by the way, by the big mar marketing budgets of the fast food companies that sit behind the health crisis because, quite simply, we have a better story to tell. When I look back, I see that this is a way of thinking. I think it's a Pacific way of thinking. Those of you who have been to Samoa would have heard the term for a Samoa, which roughly translates as the Samoan way. It's a way of thinking that goes out of the self and into the community and then across generations. I learned it in the Pacific. I guess it's an indigenous way of thinking. I learned it in the Pacific and I learned it from my parents. Community always comes first. I see it emerging in social business models and I'm thrilled to see business emerging that's based on the power of love rather than the love of power. But this is a natural way of thinking in the beautiful islands of the South Pacific. Mahalo.